Hello, hello. Uh, this is David Center of Russian Studies uh, of Harvard University. My name is Evgenia Elbots. I'm a senior uh, fellow here. And today we have a very special guest. Um, his name is uh, Christo Grozev. Hi, Christo. Hi, Evgenia. Great to see you. Uh, he's a, uh, Christo Grozev is the main Bellingcat investigator. Bellingcat is an investigative journalist group which is doing its investigation based on open sources, predominantly open sources uh, that uh, they claim existed on the web. Uh, Christo Grozev in his previous life uh, was a media manager and owner of radio station broadcasting in Bulgaria, he himself Bulgarian, and also of the several, as far as I understand, several media businesses across Europe. Is that right? Is that correct? Yeah, Bulgaria was a long time ago, but uh, Europe, uh, even until today, have some small shares in radio stations. Okay, very nice. Krista, thank you very much for agreeing to speak uh, at this Davis Center of Russian, Studies, Russian and Eurasian Studies of Harvard uh, seminar. So we are going to talk, you know, uh, to those who are totally novelled to the subject, let me tell you that Krista Grozev of Berenkert did the major investigation that uh, allowed to acknowledge the group of assassins who allegedly work for the Russian uh, political police, the FSB, that's another incarnation of the infamous Soviet political police, the KGB. That group of eight who Russian internet labeled as disgusting eight, uh, so according to an investigation that was produced by Christa and uh, uh, some uh, other journalists from Der Spiegel, CNN, and Navalny himself, uh, so uh, they uh, made an attempt to um, kill Alexei Navalny, uh, the leader of the Russian opposition, uh, who was poisoned by a military nerve agent from the group of Novichok on August 20, 2020, in the Russian Siberian city Tomsk, which is some four hours of flight east of Moscow. Uh, so uh, this group of seven operatives apparently was coordinated by the Colonel Stanislav Makshakov of the FSB Institute of Criminalistiki. That was the one investigation which and uh, Alexei Navalny put into two clips, which already uh, have been seen by more than 50 million viewers. Another investigation produced by Christo Grozev, uh, which came out just last week, suggested that almost the same group of assassins, the same group of FSB assassins uh, killed three other people Two in the Russian Caucasus, one was a journalist, another one was a human rights activist. And the third person was killed on the train and he was a one time Kremlin loyalist. Krista, is the serial killer sitting in the FSB or in Kremlin? Well, there is a serial killer sitting in Moscow. That's what we can say for sure. Whether the serial killer is technically at the FSB or in the Kremlin is uh, up for debate. It's more of a um, philosophic question than a practical uh, designation. But definitely there's a serial killer sitting in Moscow. And it's uh, a serial killer that works on an industrial scale, that works with um, delegation, that works not with his own hands, but through taxpayers funded government entities and structures at a degree that hasn't been seen, in my personal view, since Stalin times. This is nothing compar comparable to, let's say, targeted assassinations, extraterritorial assassinations conducted in the past by intelligence services abroad um, of terrorists or, or even traitors. Um, this is something that targets dissidents, that targets people that have not signed up to this rule of engagement people that are not aware that they can be on any kill list. This is extrajudicial, 
But more importantly, this is on an industrial scale. It is a structured killing machine. And therefore, um, calling it a serial killer is probably an understatement because a serial, serial killer would be limited to, to their own capability. And this is engaging the capability of a whole state. How do you know that? Your investigation is based, as you say, on the open sources, though Vladimir Putin himself, president of the Russian Federation, uh, didn't, uh, suggested that it wasn't you who conducted this investigation, but a CIA and some uh, other um, secret services existed in the West. But anyway, you claim that your uh, data uh, that you uh, that uh, you use ticketing and billing information. How provable? How 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 provable is this data? Why should we believe that the information regarding their uh, travel and their communications uh, really related to these assassinations? Well, first of all, um, you, of course, you have to work with a degree of prob probabilistics. You can't ever show the orders written by an FSB officer and signed by the president of Russia, kill this and kill that. So we have to create a uh, an assessment. And this is what any prosecutor around the world would do, any, um, any judge would do based on submissions of one side, one party and the other party. In this particular case, there's no investigation. There's no country in the world that wants to investigate this case. So we are, uh, as an investigative team of uh, volunteers and of open source researchers, we sit in the shoes of a non-existing um, prosecutor. So we have to look at the data, not from uh, individual um, uh, degree of confidence in each part of the data point of view, but holistically, all of the data creates a picture. And in order for you to say this convincing data set of many, many different ingredients creates this picture, but it's not the truth. You have to have an alternative explanation, an alibi, so to speak. And in this case, nobody has been able to offer an alibi. But let me address your specific questions. How can we trust the data? First, let, let's look at the data source we use. Uh, we started as Bellingcat working only with open source data a couple of years ago, but then we started fighting against governments or not fighting against, but investigating government crime. And government crime uh, is very difficult to investigate with only open source data because the governments are able to hide open source data. After our initial investigation of uh, Russian military presence in Eastern Ukraine that led to the shooting down of the Malaysian Boeing MH17 with 298 people abo uh, aboard, a lot of that investigation was based purely on open source data. Russian soldiers leaving accidentally photographs with metadata on, on their social media accounts. But the Russian government instituted a ban on use of uh, mobile phones in the army. And this is just one example how open source data became more, more difficult for us when we're investigating government sponsored crime. In this particular case, we had to use more than open source data. So we used closed source data. That included travel data, ticketing data for the last 10 years of our suspects and mobile phone data, including not only the listing, the logs of phone calls, but also the geolocation and the connection of, of each phone call to a particular base station, it's called the broadcasting tower, um, at any given point of time. Now, this is data we get either from whistleblowers whenever we can, or from actual people working at mobile phone companies, or even a low level people working for the police who are essentially selling this data without knowing to whom they're selling it through data brokers. And uh, we can address the ethical aspect of this if you want later, but now we're talking about the veracity of the authenticity of the data. We make, we make sure the data is authentic by applying very strict algorithms to how we work with data. First of all, we diversify the sources. None of the sources knows what we're working on. Uh, they only have compartmentalized view of a particular request of one particular telephone number or one particular um, travel record of a particular person without knowing what context this is in. And each piece of data we request from several different, from, from at least two different sources so that we can see that they match with each other. And a very important part of the algorithm is that 
we try to match each piece of current data with old data. Uh, I'll give you an example. Many years ago, three or four years ago, we were able to download a uh, very comprehensive ticketing, air, air flight ticketing data of all Russian citizens from the period 2014 until 2017. It was leaked on the whatever dark web, we were able to download it. This contains about uh, 75 million tickets sold in that period. And when we get, for example, now in the context of the Navalny investigation, we, we acquire the ticketing data for a particular suspect of ours. We make sure that the data we get now is compliant with the data for that period, 2014, 2017, from the old data. Because even if somebody tries to manipulate data today, they can't go back in time and manipulate the data from 2017 that we've received. So this is just a, a number of examples of how we make sure that the data is not manipulated. Um, well, basically, that's the answer to why we believe in the data. Um, the rest is, of course, how we convince our readers to believe in the data. In this particular case, we engaged, I mean, the findings we stumbled upon, which is that there is a machine, a government run machine to kill people, were so implausible to me that I said, we need to engage many international media with their own reputation so that we can convince the audience that this is not just a crazy guy or a crazy team, Bellingcat manufacturing data. So we involved the Spiegel, we involved CNN, we involved El Pais from, from Spain, and we involved um, our Russian traditional partner, the Insider, and we just gave this data to them and said, look at it, we won't tell you what we found, but look at these and these and these dates and tell us what you, what you see. First, second, validate the data yourself. Come reach your own conclusions about the authenticity of this data. And if you have any questions, ask us. So there was a week of these media organizations sitting down together or sitting not all together, but some of them were together with us in, in the same room, browsing through hundreds of pages of records, scratching their head and occasionally, well, cursing because what they saw was so incredible. But, but this is just a sample of how we work uh, with data and why we believe that everything we've uh, concluded on is, is uh, validated. Great. Um, what was the tipping point? So, Alexei Navalny was allegedly poisoned in the hotel in Tomsk, and then he got on the plane, and two hours into the flight, he collapsed uh, on the floor near the uh, airplane lavatory. Uh, the pilot of S-7 immediately uh, uh, landed in the city Tomsk, which is two hour flight from Tomsk. And, uh, and so he landed there, the ER, uh, the ER uh, met, Nava met uh, the plane on the field. Uh, Navalny in the ER car was given a shot of atropine. So we believe that these two things have been, a lot of people who wrote about that, believe that the pilot of S of the airline S7, Russian airline S7, uh, and the air doctor basically saved Navalny's life. Then Navalny was rushed to the hospital in Tomsk. He was already in a coma. And so in two days, uh, Putin uh, allowed to transfer Navalny to airlift Navalny to Germany. Just that's, so what was the tipping point for your investigation? Well, um, I think there were several tipping points because first we, the first tipping point is where we had a strong working hypothesis that we found the killers uh, or the would-be killers with the right motive, with the right means and, um, and, and the right method. Um, and this came when we found that three people who had traveled implausibly for a coincidental uh, itinerary had traveled with Navalny on parallel flights, not on the same flight, but just before Navalny to the city of Novo, Novosibirsk in Eastern, in Eastern uh, uh, Russia. And then four days later, five days later, had purchased tickets back from Tomsk one day after Navalny to Moscow. So uh, Evgeny, you, you're a Russian, so you can imagine the relatively implausible um, coincidence of somebody buying a ticket on the 13th of um, of August to Novo, Novosibirsk, and then on the 21st of August from Tomsk, 
overlapping with the planning of Alexei Navalny and his team. So this was our first strong hypothesis. But the tipping point actually came when we found that two of these three people that we found on these flights actually had a fake identity and they traveled under names that didn't exist in, in real life. Um, but, and the third one who traveled under his real identity, we were able to find that in the past five years, he had flown next to Alexei Navalny on parallel flights a total of 11 times, most of them concentrated in 2011. Then the next step we stumbled upon was that on the same booking as this person, his name is Vladimir Panyaev, an FSB officer, there had been six other people who often flow, flew with him at the same destination. And we identified that two of these had almost identical names and birth dates as the two fake identities that traveled with him to, um, to uh, Tomsk. When we were able to get photographs of those people, both under the fake identities and the real identities, we saw that these are the same people. Then we expanded this universe of flights that we were able to compare to one another. We had Navalny flying to a number of Russian destinations since 2017 until his coma in 2020. And then we had these seven people that we knew were somehow linked to one another because they flew often together. We compared those flights to Alexei's flights. We found a total of 37 overlapping flights. Anybody who has studied statistics and even hasn't completed the first uh, statistics 101 would know that the probability of this being a coincidence is it's almost negative. Yeah, it's 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 close to zero, um, but it's it's an in your face implausibility. That was the main topic point when we knew, OK, this is the team. There's no logic for this to not be the team. But then tipping points piled up after that. We found that of this team of seven people, uh, four were medical doctors. Two were chemical weapon specialists, and one was a member of Russia's political police, which is the Department for Protection of Constitutional Order of the FSB. This is the equivalent to the Gestapo in, in contemporary Russia. It's, it's a part of the FSB whose only goal is actually to protect and perpetuate the current regime, right, Evgeny? I mean, that, that's the way I would yes, describe it. Yes, it existed in the Soviet Union under the name the Fifth Directorate, the current, uh, it, uh, currently second service. it's a second service led by General Sedov. We are very well acquainted with the guy, yeah. Right. So, so lots we, of we, us, he created a lot of problems, yes. So, so these people always flew together and um, in about 10% of all of their flights over the last five years, they flew along with um, Alexei Navalny. And the first thing, of course, we, we always try to discard the um, innocent hypothesis or to, to look at whether there's an innocent explanation. And of course, the innocent explanation in this case was, well, everybody knows Russia is a police state. Maybe these were just people tailing Navalny because they, they wanted to know what he's up to. So maybe it was pure surveillance. Wrong, that cannot be explained by a team of doctors and chemical weapons specialists the same team always following him, which would be counter to any logic of surveillance, because in surveillance, you want to have different teams following up and changing and replacing. You've all seen the spy movies, so you know how it happens. And in surveillance, you always have them on the same flight, because otherwise you, you, you miss a significant part of the, 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 the target you're surveilling. And in their case, they always flew on other flights, either behind or before him, to make sure that he's not, um, that they don't, they're not identified. And a crucial finding that we had was that they never followed Alexei Navalny on a trip that he didn't have a hotel stay over. So if he would fly to a city for a day trip and came come back in the evening, they would never buy a ticket for that. They would just ignore that. But on every single trip during the year 2017, and that's important because that was the year that he ran for president or he wanted to run for president, but he was not allowed. On every single trip that he took where he had a stay over, they followed him. This also run the fact that they didn't follow him on day trips runs against the innocent hypothesis that he was just being surveilled. And then crucially, and that was the last tipping point, when we found out that these doctors and chemical weapons specialists are talking by phone to a Russian institute called the um, Scientific Center Signal. It's the Signal Institute, which is staffed by 12 former experts or current experts in the former 
Chemical Weapons Military Institute, Military Institute number 33 of the Ministry of Defense, which in fact tested in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, Novichok and 21 other chemical weapons. Now, there's no plausible innocent hypothesis why the team that tailed Navalny for a total of 37 flights, actually now the flight number has grown to 41 because we didn't know some identities when we published this. So on 41 different flights, medical doctors and chemical weapons specialists would be communicating with an institute that has only specialists in producing Novichok and other chemical weapons in the days and during the time that they were in Tomsk and Novosibirsk. Any court, any um, set of juries, of jury members, any prosecutor in the world would say, this is a convincing holistic case um, and the blame rests with these people. Uh, but the final straw, and I'll end here uh, in, in terms of explaining our conviction of getting to the result and the final tipping point was when we were able to find finally get the phone records of one of the doctors on the team that followed Navalny. And uh, we expected that he would not have switched on his phone on a mission like that. This was his personal phone. And he would use other methods of communication. But there's always an error, of, a margin for human error, error when we talk about people. And in this case, we were lucky to stumble across that uh, error. And that was when this person turned on his phone for a single Second, apparently, the only explanation is to look at the number that he didn't know by heart. And the phone communicated with the base station only one byte of data. And this byte placed him uh, about 20 minutes long walk from the hotel where Alexei Navalny had just gone to bed that same evening, just before waking up and going to the airport and falling into a coma a couple of hours later. So this is a sequence of the tipping points. I'm sorry I didn't have a simple answer to you, Evgenia. It's very impressive. Thank you. What is, uh, do I understand, is that right, correct to uh, that, you know, the same group of assassins uh, 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 allegedly killed uh, three other people in your latest investigation? Is it the same group? Yes, it is the same group. I, I don't think, uh, again, this is just analysis already. It's not based on knowledge, but I don't think the Kremlin or the FSB would entrust such a unlawful um, method of killing and uh, the, the, the information about this um, unlawful, both from an international law perspective, but also from a Russian law perspective, operation to more than one team. So I think it's one team. Um, but back to your question, what we saw in the actual three successful operations that we've been able to identify so far um, was presence of at least two members from this larger team at the location of the, of the suspicious death uh, by poisoning of all three um, uh, cases. Um, we believe that there's more, there are more members of this team that we haven't identified or more different fake identities that we don't know yet. But the presence of at least two members of this team in all three cases is good enough for us to assign those uh, suspicious deaths to this operation as well. So there is a group of assassins who uh, work out of the, uh, uh, who belong to the military intelligence group, who conduct uh, assassinations outside Russia, and a group, and the, those who conduct assassinations in, uh, domestically. Is that right? That is right. There's an overlap between the two groups, and the overlap is in the means and methods section. Uh, they both use often Novichok, not always. Um, the FSB uses other poisons as well for less important targets, but I'm sure we'll get to that topic. But the means is the same. Both the GRU and the FSB get their Novichok from the Signal Institute. That's what we've been able to prove through uh, monitoring the uh, communication, um, the, the pattern of communication. Both the GRU kill team and the FSB kill team uh, communicate with the Signal Institute scientists just before de departing on an operation. Just today, it became known that one of the, of the doctors who was treating Alexei Navalny in Omsk all of a sudden uh, dropped dead at the age of 55. His name is Sergei Maximishin. Uh, he was in charge of intensive care at the Omsk hospital uh, where Alexei Navalny was treated for two days. Uh, so, and according to um, I, I have here Daily Mail, 
uh, quelled. A doctor who was in charge of treating Alexei Navalny in Russia soon after he was poisoned. Yes, uh, so they suspect that he was also uh, killed. What is your take on this? That's the, uh, that's, uh, that's the doctor who dropped I... day to day. Mm -hmm. If you had asked me uh, this question six months ago, before this last investigation, I would say that coincidences happen and that uh, it would be against the Kremlin's self-interest to conduct such an uh, obvious assassination of somebody who would be immediately um, uh, attributed or, or a death that would be immediately attributed by the Daily Mail or by the global media to the Kremlin. Um, but that was based on an instinct I had earlier to assess the probability of a crime having taken place uh, that factored into this algorithm of the instinct, the cost of reputation, the reputation cost for the Kremlin. Since this investigation, I've and since what happened in the last two weeks in with the protests in Moscow and the arrests of thousands of people, including journalists, um, I believe that the concept of reputation cost is completely ignored by the Kremlin. And therefore, I'm no longer um, I wouldn't be surprised if this is what happened. We have seen that uh, the team of, F of the same poison team that we discussed traveled to Omsk, the place of the hospital, not only the immediate aftermath of the poisoning, uh, for which we received an explanation through a confession by one of the poison team members who said they were, they were there to clean up the traces of the evidence in August and September. But we saw that members of this team traveled to Omsk in October and December. Of 2020. That would not make sense from the point of view of cleaning up traces anymore. So the question emerges whether there was a planned operation already to dispose of some of the witnesses. Now, again, this sounds crazy and not in the interest of the Kremlin, but I'm no longer convinced that the Kremlin is thinking of its own reputational interest anymore. Thank you. Uh, there are suspicions that Navalny and his wife, uh, Julia, were poisoned before and survive. Do you confirm? I confirm the suspicion. I cannot confirm with the same degree of certainty that they were poisoned. What we have as evidence uh, very quickly was that in a trip uh, a month and a half before the final nearly lethal trip for Alexei, uh, that was to the Russian town of Kaliningrad, he and his wife went, went there for a week of a romantic getaway. And we noticed that the same poisoners, the same team of FSB officers, flew to Kaliningrad just a couple of hours before Alexei and his wife were there. And they stayed there until the fourth day of their romantic getaway. And then they returned to Moscow on the fifth, on the fifth day. On the same day that they returned to Moscow, Yulia Navalny felt very, very similar symptoms to the symptoms of poisoning that Alexei had uh, a month and a half later, except they were weaker. Uh, which could be explained according to many chemical weapons specialists that we consulted with her being accidentally exposed to a smaller dosage. Having found later the, the method, the most likely method of application uh, of the poison, which was through underwear or through uh, underwear um, of Alexei Navalny, where the kill team was apparently able to access and, and place the poison, it could be that um, Yulia came in contact with poisoned um, underwear uh, or, or clothes of Alexei Navalny, but that was for a short time and she was not exposed to a lethal dose of it. Again, what we have is the same team being there and uh, a member of the family being um, experiencing uh, serious symptoms of some sort of poisoning. One of the uh, developers of this military agent, uh, nerve agent Novichok, uh, told me that the poison, that the original, you know, uh, creation, their poison, uh, was not meant to kill individual people, but, quote, something like a battalion at the battlefield. It was to be placed, that Novichok, was to be placed in something like a grenade and thrown at the soldiers. Thus, um, and therefore, uh, he said that, obviously, for the FSB assassin, for the alleged uh, FSB assassins, it was quite difficult to define the exact doors suitable to poison to death. Therefore, assassins, um, so uh, he suspects that assassins were trying uh, poison 
either on other people or even on Navalny himself in order to define the, uh, the lethal dose. Do you buy this? Um, I cannot speak to that. Uh, what, what I do know from talking to many experts in um, chemical weapons, also from the uh, for, former employees of the uh, Organization for Protection of Chemical Weapons, is that Novichok indeed presents a problem when individually administered in the dosage. Because if you apply too little, then um, the person will get away with just a, a, a discomfort. And, um, and this is linked to the fact that Novichok essentially affects your nerve connectors. And the body is like an internet is able to reroute its nerve uh, connections, uh, even if 90%, almost 90% of the nerve connectors are broken. So if you, if you misapply, if you have a low dosage, the person will notice, but will not really know that they're poisoned. And if you do it uh, with an overdosage, with, with definitely sufficient dosage, the person may die immediately, which would link the, the crime to, to, uh, to the perpetrators too easily. Um, and, and furthermore, it is risking a blowback to the poisoner himself or herself. So finding the right dosage is very difficult. Therefore, uh, a long-term testing um, process is, is a must-have. Whether they did it on animals, which is not possible um, properly, or on inmates, or on real targets, I, I cannot speak to that, but on somebody, they must have tested it. Yes, Bill Zayana, one of the developers of the Novichok claims that human, uh, human patches were used when they were developing that poison during the Soviet times. However, you know, the, of course, you know, the question flies, Krista. Anna Politkovska was killed by a bullet. The same happened to Boris Nemtsov, who was killed, you know, just 100 meters uh, away from Kremlin. And Mark Kramer, uh, whom you probably know, the director of the Davis Center's uh, Cold War uh, Studies Center, he asks the following. And in fact, you know, I think he is right now in, his, in your home country. Why do the Kremlin authorities rely on poisoning? Sometimes the poison kills the target, uh, but at other times it doesn't. When Ramzan Kadyrov wants someone killed, that's of course, you know, Mark's suspicion. He orders his assassins to shot the target, a technique that is almost always successful. Why does the Kremlin not rely on guns instead of poison? Because of deniability. There's a requirement for deniability when we're, you're dealing with um, high level opposition figures or high profile people in general. And one form of deniability is Ramzan Kadyrov if you know what I mean. Um, until recently, uh, and I, my, my hypothesis on Nemtsov's likely and on Politovska's likely um, motives has changed since I investigated the Navalny case. Earlier, I thought the most likely explanation is uh, Russian uh, power figures like uh, Ramzan Kadyrov or even oligarchs are trying to deliver a present to the Kremlin that is, some, that is probably not even desirable for the Kremlin because the Kremlin could not benefit from uh, such a disbalance of reputation cost versus getting rid of a nuisance like, uh, like Nemtsov. Um, but now I do think that's more likely that the Kadyrov Avenue was just one of the ways to have a deniable assassination. Oh, sorry, it wasn't us. It was just some crazy Chechens. And in the same way, the deniability can be achieved through a successful poisoning by, uh, by, by poison. What we see now is three cases that we believe we prove, proved were based on an FSB assassination campaign. And nobody knew that that was, in fact, well, there were a lot of suspicions, but nobody could prove that they were poisoned by the government. Everybody assumed, okay, natural causes, or maybe even a local uh, enemy must have, must have perpetrated it. So you see, it's similar, it's deniable, either when you do it through a way that you can always write it off as a natural cause or through a bullet, but done in the hands of somebody who we can say, that's not us. Uh, let me tell uh, our audience, you know, to those of you who may not know, Ramzan Kadyrov is the leader of Chechnya. Uh, he was his uh, father, uh, was a famous sheikh in Chechnya in, uh, the, at the time where in the 1990s before the war. 
So, and he himself grew up basically uh, among the guerrillas, with the guerrillas. And, you know, when Putin became the president, he made peace with Chechnya and Ramzan Kadyrov became the willing executioner of, uh, of what Putin wanted from him. The, the uh, enforcer, let's call it the enforcer. The enforcer, okay, yeah. very good. Um, question from the audience, how did you identify the suspects? Um, actually it was um, by merging two ends of our investigation. One was tracking the poison and the other one was tracking the people. When we tracking the poison means we followed the phone calls that were made by scientists from the signal center because we had identified from another investigation on the GRU that these scientists manufactured the Novichok. So we noticed that they talked to some members uh, from FSB um, and then we parked that for a while because we didn't know where these members, uh, what part of the FSB they belong to. And then on the other hand, we went through the uh, travel records of people that flew alongside Navalny. And long story short, we found an overlap between six people that both talked to the Signal Institute and traveled alongside Navalny. These six people became the core of our identification. It's probably also, you know, you, I, I believe you haven't mentioned it, that they never traveled together with Navalny, correct? No. There no, were I... those who conducted surveillance, obviously, but, you know, those assassins who you identified, they never traveled on the same airplane with Navalny. Is that no, right? they never did. They never did. Uh, we had a hypothesis that that's because they don't want to uh, ever be um, seen over a long term of, uh, of, of tracking him. But this was actually confirmed in a phone call uh, that uh, Evgeny, we haven't mentioned, but uh, Alexei Navalny called one of his own poisoners um, after we presented him with our findings um, in a prank call. And he was able to get him to talk for 50 minutes uh, under the pretense of reporting to an upper security official of the failed operation on Navalny himself. And this person actually explained in that 50 minute call that they never traveled along with Navalny uh, in order exactly to never be noticed. Right, you know, it was my next question. You know, uh, for those of you who are interested, you can go on Navalny.com and you can watch this conversation. Um, it is in the second clip. So first, Navalny put out the investigation that was done by Christa and others. And then uh, after the first clip came out, uh, Vladimir Putin, president of Russia, had a presser and he was asked about this investigation. He said that, of course, it's all BS and, you know, there is nothing, you know, real in these and, you know, who cares about Navalny and who's, uh, he never mentions Navalny, of course, you know, by, by his name, who cares about he, uh, he said, you know, who is he, uh, to deal with, and you know, if we wanted to poison, to kill, we would definitely get the job done," said the president of the Russian Federation. Correct? That is so, correct. Let me, let me just correct one thing because actually, in that presser, he did validate a big part of our investigation. He said, "Yeah, I know about that investigation, and yes, there were these FSB officers trailing him, but of course, he's a." Uh, spy, he's an enemy of the state, and therefore, of course, he should expect to be surveilled. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. So uh, Vladimir Putin made his that statement on Thursday, and next Monday, correct, Navalny right. put out another clip, and in that clip, Navalny pretended to be an assistant to Nikol General Nikolai Patrushev, you know, Putin's pal from the KGB, and now, you know, the, the head of the uh, Russian uh, Security Council, one of those, you know, uh, hardliners uh, in the current Kremlin. So Navalny pretended to be his assistant, and he said that he's preparing a report uh, for Mr. Patrushev, and he has to do it very, very quickly. It was early in the morning. So, and he started, and so he started asking uh, these operative questions and the, this operative, he's a cleaner, right? Chistichik, yes. you know, 
um, he acknowledged that, you know, what you know already Christa said, and he also said that, you know, apparently poison was poured in the court piece of uh, Navalny's underwear. So that was, you know, a great piece of investigation that came out that, of course, you know, made Kremlin just the, it was obviously, it was, you could feel it. Kremlin was stunned. Uh, another question, uh, do you agree with the claim that Russian security agencies represent an independent political group that can seize control over political decisions? Uh, do you want to uh, answer that question, Krista? I'll give my answer, but I think yours is, is probably more qualified. Um, I think they can become one. They're not one now. I think there are mechanisms to uh, in, introduce by Putin to minimize that risk by having, for example, access to chemical weapons and access to, um, to, to explosives of, uh, of a large scale, um, being subject to two signatures from two different agencies, one from the FSB, one from the FSO, which is the secret service under the direct control of Putin. Um, and as of now, I think the Silovics, the, um, the uh, intelligence services are complying with this. This can change, however, I think, when Putin becomes too uh, much of a hot potato for the elite. And the elite is able to convince some of the security top brass to change sides. That's just my, my, my impression. Uh, Evgenia, I'll lead to, yield to you. I really think that you know it's already all happened and the Russia's run, it's a corporate state and it's run by the corporation of the graduates of the KGB. So, and there are of course, you know, some uh, civilians, you know, and whose duty is to write economy on a day-to-day -day basis. This kind of regimes are very well known in political science, especially in the Latin America, they're called bureaucratic, military, authoritarian regimes. So, but anyway, um, here is another question. Uh, about this Navalny's prank call. Did you, the investigators, have any expectation beforehand about what you would be able to extract in the phone call? Or was it a shot in the dark? Did you have any appreci uh, appre uh, appreciation about the chance of success of one of the prank calls? Yes, I thought the chance was zero, literally zero. Um, the plan was completely different. The plan was for Alexei to uh, confront his would-be killers and to tell them literally, hi, my name is Alexei Navalny. You may hear, you may remember me from the time you tried to kill me. Why did you do that? That was actually the plan. And um, I thought it was just a moral um, requirement and right for him to do it. He himself changed the script in the middle of the calls to the prank call. He did it on two people. The first one reacted exactly as I imagined it would happen. He said, no, you're not an aide to partnership. I know exactly who you are. And he hung up. And the second one, totally unexpected. The first three minutes, I thought that this person was even playing a game and trying to just keep Navalny going for whatever reason. I even expected some Russian FSB to show up at the, in the room where we were in Germany uh, and then bring down the door. Uh, but then the breaking point was when this same officer gave new information that we didn't even have before. And then I knew this is for real. This guy really thinks he's talking to uh, the aide to the boss. And this new information related to the fact that uh, he was cleaning the court piece and the poison was put there. Uh, that's right? That's one. And the second one was he gave names that we didn't know about. He gave the name of the local um, FSB officer from the Constitutional Protection um, Unit in Omsk, who was actually stealing Navalny's clothes from the hospital and taking them to him for cleaning. So this was a new, new piece of information we didn't have. But more importantly, he validated our own interpretation of why Navalny survived. Because one of the questions Alexei Navalny asked him was, why did you fail? And then he said, circumstances. The pilot landed the plane too early and the paramedics on the landing strip accidentally gave him the right treatment. So these two negative developments made it not work in our favor. This was the first time I was hearing somebody talk about um, prevention of death as negative developments. Uh, what is the job description in this, uh, in this disgusting aid? 
Do you understand? I think who I was, do. Are there, you know, some specific person who did put the poison in the hotel, in tongs, in, the, in Navalny's underwear? Based on the overlap of uh, people over different poisoning attempts, we can be sure that the critical, the crucial people are um, Alexei Alexandrov and Ivan Osipov, medical doctors who have worked in this unit since 2010. Uh, so more than 10 years now. And uh, one of them even earlier from 2007. I think I have a vague understanding of how they were able to change from medical doctors treating people to killers. And it's kind of a, a typical uh, boiling, slow boiling the frog phenomenon. Initially, they were given targets that looked legitimate to them. They were given targets of legitimate terrorists um, during the Second, uh, uh, Second Chechen War. There were terrorist attacks in the aftermath of that on, on Russian citizens, and they were sent to assassinate terrorists. And then slowly over time, this went through a hyper hypertrophy of, of the whole uh, institute of this, of this uh, killing machine with more and more personal corporate interests being added to the legitimate targets. And I think these guys just missed the moment when they became uh, killers for hire for, for President Putin. Thank you. Um, we cannot avoid this question, but you know, and that's the question who ordered the killing or, you know, attempt on, uh, on life of the leader of the Russian opposition. And just before, you know, um, I, when I was preparing for this conversation and writing something as well, I once again, I was going through the written, through the handwritten um, minutes that was written by Pavel Sudaplatov the head, the chief assassin in the Stalinist time. One of those who was preparing the assassination of Lev Trotsky, uh, along with his deputy, Aitin Gorner, who was involved in several other uh, assassinations, including one of the American citizen organs uh, um, back uh, in the post-war time. So in his, that's the letter when he was, uh, when Khrushchev, you know, succeeded, uh, uh, became the, the, the leader of the country, uh, Sudaplatov as some other, um, as some other um, Stalin's uh, henchmen uh, were put in jail, was sentenced to 15 years in jail. He spent 13 years in jail and he was released. And by the end of his life, he was, he was pretty much rehabilitated. But what's important about these memos is that, and the reason why I was returning back to reading all these uh, very interesting documents that, you know, uh, Suda Platov uh, writes about, you know, people who gave him orders. And almost in each and every case, the order to kill this or another person was given either by Stalin himself, the leader of the then Soviet Union, or by Molotov, uh, uh, the minister of foreign affairs and then the chief of government, uh, or by two of them. So it is to say that in each and every case, there was the leader of the state, of the Soviet state, who gave the order. When I spoke to um, several of my sources from uh, the KGB, in, they, uh, they kept telling me that in each case when KGB was involved in any assassinations uh, later um, after Stalin died, was the general secretary of the Communist Party, and we know that Khrushchev himself ordered the assassination of Bandera and then one another person. Anyway, that it was you know the leader of the country who gave this order because only the leader of the country was able to provide some sort of your know, guarantee to the executioner, to you know, enforcer, Absolutely. as you like to yeah. put it. So Given that, do you think that Putin himself 
president of the Russian Federation himself gave an order to kill Navalny? I can, for myself, I can bet my, my own uh, lifetime reputation on the fact that he approved it. I don't know if he initiated the idea or Patrushev or somebody came and said, I have a great idea. Uh, let's let's kill him so that nobody knows. I'm absolutely sure that Putin approved it for the same reasons that, that you by peril gave as an example from uh, Soviet times, but also for another reason. Both Stalin and Putin are paranoid about their own circle and about their power uh, clinging to power. And therefore giving a tool, an extrajudicial tool with some degree of self-sufficiency uh, poisoners to others to decide who is a target, that runs against this paranoia. He would never allow for this unit to decide on its own who to poison. He would never allow them to get the actual poison for this particular operation without his own signature. Just because if he didn't do that, if he didn't have control over that, one day he might be on the receiving end. So all of these make it impossible, absolutely impossible, that Putin did not approve every single operation. Uh, the question is, can he manage so many approvals? Our estimate based on travel data is that these people kill or try to kill about eight to 10 people per year. So yes, he can manage that. Thank you. It was very, uh, very smart explanation. Uh, Hrista, uh, do you worry that transparency, that's the question from the audience, about your data methods, which helps build and strengthen your case and will make it easier for the future bad actors to cover their tracks. Absolutely. And that was a very, very big dilemma we had to address before publishing this investigation. Um, the end result was we concluded that the public interest in understanding and believing this data overweighs the, our own ability to continue to work. And we, are, we realized and we already experienced difficulties in continuing our investigations. But I think this was the tipping point where we had to actually say enough is enough and, uh, and convince the world uh, that this is what's happening in a contemporary country. What do you expect going forward? Now that Bellingcat has publicized these findings, will the Kremlin continue to rely on Novichok and the specific assassins? And what's going to happen to those assassins? I don't think they will be um, killed if that's uh, the sort of undertone of the question. Um, unlike Stalin times, in today's Russia, we haven't seen actually killings due to uh, mistakes. We've seen killings due to betrayal, uh, but not to mistakes. So I think they will be punished by being sent to do a desk job in an uninteresting part of Russia. Um, but I don't think they will be incarcerated or killed. The question is, can they replace them with somebody else soon enough? And I think the value of our transparent investigation is that I cannot imagine anyone, any doctor, now accepting the job offer um, and believing, hmm, this can be kept secret forever. I think the deterrent effect of our investigation will make it very difficult for the Kremlin to re-employ people for the next 10 years. Krista, thank you so much. It's so promising, you know. I feel well, real I better. <laughs> yeah, returning back home. Uh, does Krista have any hypothesis about how the FSB poisoner could be fooled so easily during the prank call? Yes. Um, if you speak Russian, you would probably find it more easy, easier to believe than if you don't, because Alexei Navalny is probably the best actor I've ever heard in my life. He was able to impersonate not only the the, the speech pattern, not only the, uh, the vocabulary of the militarized system of the FSB, but also their bullying method. And basically his, his speech was pest, peppered with uh, a parasitic phrase like, you know what the boss is expecting, you know what, that before eight I need to deliver, or you know what will happen to me. And this guy felt sympathetic to this guy, uh, to, to Alexei, who was uh, in his view, the eight to the boss. And he was also bullied. So he was both felt bullied and sympathetic at the same time. And it was this pressure, time pressure, I need this before eight or we're both in trouble that actually worked. Again, I don't have a full explanation because myself, I was so shocked that it did work. But Alexei was improbably um, uh, an amazing actor that morning. 
All right, but it also very, you know, very well describes the psych of the uh, the psychology of the uh, members of the Russian bureaucracy. Somebody from the big boss, assistant to big boss, to the general from the called and asked him questions. He probably felt even empowered by that, that you know, Patrushov himself wanted information from him. Let me add to that. You're absolutely right, Evgeny, and I, I forgot this is an important thing. The Alexei character called and said, I'm calling you first before I call even your boss because I got a good word about you from the top guy. And, and he was like, he knows me in person? And Alexei said, yes, Bogdanov knows you in person. So this worked. And, um, and, and, and I think uh, also probably he wasn't too intelligent, this chemical weapon specialist, because um, he asked on an open line, but is it acceptable for us to talk on, on an open line? And then on an open line, Alexei told him, oh, yes, it is acceptable to talk on an open line. So this vicious circle didn't actually um, strike him as uh, any possible conversation. Exactly. And that's another something that tells uh, us about the Russian bureaucracy. Protocol, rules, norms, they're much less important than the hierarchy, exactly. than, you know, the call from some bossy person, right? This, this is very interesting. I mean, you know, for anyone who is going to do Russian bureaucracy, this is amazing. Or anybody who wants to do a psychology uh, case study or a PhD, I think this call is amazing. Finally, you know, we uh, left just, you know, with two minutes, and I have to ask you this question. You mentioned this, you know, the ethic, to which extent it was ethical to pay money for the information that you were obtaining through uh, on the dark internet. Uh, yes, in uh, many, uh, in the European journalists, it's pretty much allowed. You know, journalists in, in much of Europe and much of Western Europe and Italy and France, even sometimes in Great Britain, they do pay, especially those in tabloids, they do pay for information. However, across the Atlantic in the United States, uh, it, 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 the, the, uh, the line of thought is the following. If you pay for the information, then somebody who is providing you information will feed you with frenzy just because he or she wants to get your money. What is your response to that? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, 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 there are many reasons not to. The one that you gave as an example does not apply in this case because the people who are selling this information, they don't know why they're providing this information. They don't know the, the topic of the information. They don't even know the subject. They don't know the names on which they're providing information. And uh, they're just in the trading business of information so that they're just making a buck. So it's only a question of whether we want to accept that, uh, that information, that ethical bargain. And it's just a matter of public interest. Um, this same information would be easily acceptable without any money to the investigative authorities in Russia if they wanted to investigate this crime. Clearly, they're not going to investigate a crime of their own president. So that is not an option. What is the, the other alternative for a foreign government to investigate? Nobody wants to do that because nobody wants to cross the border of national sovereignty. So nobody, Germany doesn't want to investigate a crime that happened in Russia. We are left filling in the shoes of investigators. We don't have access to cross-border databases. We have to buy that data and we do. And we should, of course, say that Russian government, Russian law, so-called law enforcement agencies refused in, even initiate the criminal case on the suspected attempt on Alexei Navalny's life. This is a telling, telling um, fact. Uh, why Navalny came back to Russia if he knew he would be arrested? I asked him that back in November and um, he was already then determined to come back in the middle of uh, January. And he explained it simply, I know I can be arrested. I suspect I might be killed, but if I stay here, I will, I will never be able to contribute to Russia. I will never be able to be a politician because I will be written off within a couple of months as one of the many emigres, like Evgenia, who went to live a normal life abroad. Yeah? And uh, he, did, he wanted to be a politician, not a journalist. And I think that's a difference. Um, and, and he needs to be where the, his potential electorate is. And yeah, the, the, the unique thing about him is he's willing to take the, pay the price of staying in jail for a year or two, um, just knowing that one day he'll be out, hopefully, and will be able to continue his work.
Not many can do that. I should correct you, Krista. Evgenia never immigrated. Evgenia went uh, to the United States to teach because I was unable to make any money in Russia anymore. So that allowed me to pay uh, some salaries uh, on my website, The New Times. And early March, I'm returning back to Russia. I just uh, so just to make sure. Uh, That's and because I told you have... that those guys are without a job, right? <laughs> um, do you, are you afraid that Navalny is going to get killed in jail? I am afraid. I really am afraid. That's a function of the, this newly found uh, observation that there is no reputation cost that the Kremlin is willing to, uh, is not willing to pay. Um, I think they may do something even worse. They might uh, actually torture him or, or just try to create a uh, mental breakdown for him in jail, uh, which in some cases may be even worse than that. So yes, I do not exclude that at all. Once again, in the Soviet past, there were cases like that. One of them was, uh, there, there was a dissident Morozov who was tricked by the KGB who basically disclosed some names, people were arrested, Morozov hanged himself in the cell. There was another case of the famous dissident Marchenka, you know, who went on the hunger strike and died in, uh, in jail. What can be done? You know, realistically speaking, how can, what kind of pressure uh, should be executed? Uh, what can we do in order to get Navalny out? Well, now we're we have to change our hats from journalists and investigators to actual citizens and activists. So uh, that is just my personal opinion. But uh, I think this is a quantum difference between everything we've seen before. We are seeing a, um, a structured killing machine and it's not enough to express for governments to express concern as has happened so far. It is time to treat the Russian government at least temporarily no different than the government of North Korea it is a terrorist government and it has to be treated as one by everybody. And our citizen role as non-government officials is to actually explain to the passive part of the, uh, of the population that is not following the news that this is happening. And it's a different Russia than the Russia we wanted to be friends with uh, even 15 years ago. In one of the interviews, you, Krista, says, said that this was your last investigation. Are you fearful for her, your life? Yes, I am fearful for my life. Um, again, I don't think they will act soon or, uh, um, or quickly, but we see that they take their time. We saw it with uh, uh, Skripal. But um, this is not something that I can just stop halfway in the, in the midstream. So I have to continue at least this vector of investigations. Who else did these people try to kill? and who else did they actually kill? So this I see as one long investigation. It will probably take the rest of this year for me. For those, uh, for the audience, I should say that Krista Grozyev put uh, his data on the web. So any of you who would like to check uh, this data or help uh, to find others who uh, were assassinated or, um, or else, uh, you can find these on the web, just Google Krista Grozyev uh, data, and you will be able to do it uh, yourself. Krista, uh, probably this is the very last question because our time up. Uh, what kind of sanctions do you expect from the Western countries as a response to the attempt to kill Alexei Navalny? I expect that um, the Institute uh, institutes that we identified as actually manufacturing Novichok these days should be sanctioned. I expect that the actual full um, uh, listing of employees of the Institute of Criminalistics should be sanctioned, but that would that is not going to work for uh, changing the system. I think what can work is what Alexei Navalny himself has suggested, going after close allies of President Putin, close friends of President Putin, who uh, keep his money and making them feel like he's the hot potato for them and making change from within by actually people uh, stopping to be proxies for President Putin. Do you believe that Western governments will do this? I do. We're talking about billionaires. I do. I do believe. Okay. I love your optimism. Let's hope 
that our next interview with you will be, you know, about something, um, you know, about outcomes of your investigation and there will be, oh, we'll talk about flowers. Do you okay. like flowers, Krista? Well, my, I've spent most of my business time in the Netherlands and yes, we have a lot of flowers there. Okay, great. Uh, this was Krista Grosif, the main investigator of the Bell and Cat. I'm grateful to you, Krista, for taking part in this uh, conversation. I'm grateful to the organizers of this event, to Chris, to Penelope, to uh, everybody, who, to Daniel, and to the executive director of the Davis Center of Russian and Eurasian Studies, Alexander Vakvro, for allowing me to run that seminar. Thank you so much, and uh, let's God help us. Goodbye.